The psalmist said, it is good. Then they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. It is good to be here today and so good to see all of you on this beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, we're entering a busy season, which is different in these COVID days, but nonetheless, a lot going on in our congregation and community. And I just want to mention a few things about uh, today's service and uh, the weeks to come in our church. First, uh, today, as you see, we will celebrate the Sacrament of Communion. And as has become our practice, we will invite you to come down the center aisle and partake of the elements here and dispose of the containers therein, and then proceed back to your seat and just be aware of, um, of distancing from others as you come down uh, to partake of the elements. We look forward to that later in the service. Uh, there is uh, an, a slip in the newsletter, and Ethel, are there also slips for poinsettias somewhere else in, in the back? Uh, to order poinsettias for the holiday season, so if you'd like to do that, take note of that. Find them at the back or again in the newsletter. Uh, in the newsletter, also, you'll see an announcement that we are looking for a representative to the Association of Churches here in Claysville. If you have interest in that and representing us uh, at those regular meetings, helping coordinate things like our Thanksgiving service, the joint services that we have, the Advent and Lenten meals that we have together, uh, please contact Ethel and you can find a description of that job in the newsletter. The children during this season are beginning to do a project to create a Thanksgiving tree downstairs as part of their children's, uh, uh, children's church. What they would like for you to do is for each family to fill out um, a, it's a, in the shape of a hand in the baskets over here at the back window on the left, my left side, your right side, uh, a hand for you to write down something that from your family that you are thankful for. And the children are gonna do their own and they're gonna put those on a tree downstairs. You can also, if you'd like, bring it downstairs to put on the tree, but if you just put it in the empty basket, they will collect them and do that for you. And then we can look at that uh, when we get to Thanksgiving. This week, uh, we do celebrate Veterans Day. And so we have our Veterans Day flag up here. Uh, let's give thanks for all those who do serve and have served in the military, served our country, and uh, thank a veteran this week for, for their service. Please uh, note the newsletter for other announcements, other opportunities that are coming in the coming weeks. And uh, again, good to be together. Let us worship together now.
tempest is sad, we seek deep within our restful souls for recreation. This is Sunday. We celebrate the bright resurrection and the good news. This is the day which God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, ready to relent from punishing. Be assured that in Christ Jesus you have been forgiven. Glory be to God.
to talk to the children just for a moment. Any of you ever need help remembering things? You've got really good minds, all of you, and you probably have great memories, but my guess is things like cleaning up your room, maybe you'd need something to help you remember that. I remember once when I was maybe just a little older than some of you, once my mother was cooking something on the stove and she was cooking it in, it's called a pressure cooker, it's this big pot, and when it starts to steam and there's a little thing on it that starts to make a noise, and when that happens, you have to turn it down. And so I was, I don't know, watching cartoons or something. And my mother said, now I'm gonna go out for just a minute. When this starts to jiggle and you hear that sound, come over and turn the stove off. Well, I needed some help remembering that. I didn't remember, I got caught up in what I was doing and all of a sudden I heard this and I thought, I think I'm in trouble. <laughs> I did not remember. I could have used a little note or something to help me remember it. Uh, we often need things to help us remember things we're supposed to do or remember things that are important. We're going to be reading a passage from the book of Joshua in the Old Testament in a little bit. And it says that Joshua gave this big sermon to the people of Israel. He told them how much God loved them and he told them things God expected of them. And then he set up this big stone and he said, now this stone is here to remind you of all these things. It was a pretty big deal. It sounded like the stone was almost alive. It was it's kind of weird a little bit, but important that they needed something to remind them of all these things. And we need things like that to remind us of mo what's most important. And we have something in our service today that's a big reminder to us of how much God loves us. And that's this table right here. Because the table is a reminder that Jesus died for us and that God raised Jesus from the dead. And that's mainly how we know who God is and how much God loves us. So every time we have this table set up with the bread and the juice to remember Jesus' death and his sacrifice for us, that's the purpose of it. And that's really important, okay? Let's say a prayer and thank God for this reminder of what's important to us. Thank you, God, for reminding us in really important ways of how much you love us and what you call us to do and who you call us to be as your people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. Joshua 24, 1 through 3, and 14 through 25. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors, Terah and his sons, Abram, Abraham, and lived beyond the Euphrates and settled and served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave him out Isaac. Now therefore revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now if you are willing to serve the Lord, Choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, 
Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And who did these, those great signs in our sight? He protected us along all the way that we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples. <coughs> Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. But Joshua said to the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourselves, that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses, he said. Then put away the foreign gods that are among you, and incline your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. The people said to Joshua, The Lord our God we will serve, and him we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day made statutes and ordinances for them at Shechem. The word of the Lord. New Testament lesson comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, and verses 1 through 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five of them were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flask of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them came, became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You'd better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went out to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the other bridesmaids came, also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore. For you know neither the day nor the hour. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O Lord, let now the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When the legendary musician Johnny Cash died, members of his family shared lots of memories about his life and his life with his wife, June Carter Cash. One of the things they shared that got uh, published and became sort of viral on the internet was a to-do list that he had made that they discovered among his belongings. The list included some mundane things that he had to take care of that particular day, but it had two things that were kind of striking related to his relationship with his wife. First on the list, it said, kiss June. And then after that on the list, it said, don't kiss anyone else. It seemed he had to remind himself that the ring of fire was real and he had to encircle it in the right place. The passage that Cheryl read for us from Joshua is a farewell sermon followed by a kind of ceremony Joshua conducted with the Israelites as they'd entered into the land and before he died. Embedded in that sermon and in this ceremony is a kind of to-do list. It has two primary items on it, sort of like that list that Johnny Cash made, one positive and one negative. The first one that he lists, that he mentions, is the negative one, put away the foreign gods that are among you. 
Now, he's referring here to the gods of the nations all around or the common gods that people kept that were sort of like good luck charms to them. These gods were attractive because, like the ones that still exist today, they were gods that promised prosperity and blessing, but with little demand. And there was one of them for just about everything. These are the gods that just sort of tell you what you want to hear. They're gods of money, gods of nationalism, gods that say our tribe is pure and righteous while the others are all contempt, uh, are corrupt and evil. These are gods sort of like, or including, the god that one essayist recently has referred to as the god within. There is a big movement today, you know, among people who sort of want to be religious or spiritual, but have lost track of the God of the Bible and of the Christian faith. They look within, though, and think they hear a voice speaking to them, and they refer to that as God. It's remarkably telling them just what they already want to hear and what they already want to do. And so this writer refers to it as the God within. It's a God who just prods you to pursue the path that you would pursue already and affirms it for you. In the ancient world, there were gods represented by statues, idols, that did all these things, and people worshiped them in a quite formal way. The nations around Israel each had its own God, and the Israelites knew of all these. There was a God for anything that you might want or need or desire. Joshua said to the people, put away these gods, get them out of your sight. As he does that, he tells them a story. It's their own story of how God chose them as a people and rescued them from slavery in Egypt. But he begins by telling them that once their ancestors who lived over in Mesopotamia worshiped foreign gods, it's a part of the story that doesn't get a lot of attention, but there it is in this re rehearsal of God's salvation of the people. He's talking about Abraham and his family, his father Terah and their family who lived uh, far, far away. And then God called Abraham to travel over to the land of Canaan and promised him that land. We don't know much about this, these gods they worshipped or how Abraham was involved in it. But to ancient Jews, this became a fascination. And they created legends about how it might have gone with Abraham and his family before he was called by God to go to the land of Canaan to set out in this life of faith. And in the stories, Abraham's father, Terah, worships these other gods, but not just that. He was actually a manufacturer of idols. And in one of the stories, Abraham comes home, or Abraham's father goes out one day and leaves Abraham there alone. And Abraham goes in, he has this sort of innate sense that these idols don't represent real powers in the world, but simply the desires that people have. And so he smashes all the idols. Abraham's father comes home and walks into his workshop and sees this and says, son, what have you done? And I imagine then maybe he said something like, you know, there goes your college tuition. Um, but these stories the Jews produce, they thought a lot about how it was that the ancestors worshiped these other gods, but now they're called to put such gods away. Put them away in favor of the one true God the Israelites called Yahweh. For this is the God who has rescued you from slavery in Egypt. He is the creator, the king of the universe, and he expects things of you. These other gods don't ask anything of you. They just let you ask them favors. But this true God saves you and in turn asks for your devotion to him. So the second thing Joshua said is serve the Lord. Serve him alone. 
This is really important. It's not enough just to put away the foreign gods and to say, I'm not going to pay attention to them. It's essential that we also hear this word to serve the Lord, to be active in the way we obey God and seek after him. Some of you, uh, those of you who are married, might be able to relate to this. Imagine what it would be like if you went out for the day and came home and said to your spouse at the end of it, you know, um, I've gone through this day today without holding anybody else's hand or kissing anybody else. And so I'm done with my obligation to you. I, I've never tried that. I don't think I'm going to uh, with Paige. There's so much more to it than that, isn't there? I mean, um, there's the garbage to take out, there are duties to attend to, and there's to see the person you're sharing life with and to ask what are his needs, her needs, what are they struggling with? Is, is she tired? Is she at the end of her rope? Where do I pick things up here? All of that is involved in fulfilling the vows of marriage, not just I haven't been unfaithful with anyone else, but how am I working as your partner, supporting you? Joshua says a similar thing about the people in their relationship with their God. This is how it works. You actively pursue God who has pursued you, he says. And the people hearing this charge from Joshua say, we will. We will serve the Lord. Then Joshua responds in a kind of curious way. He says, can't do it. Uh, as if to say, you, you're not up to it. Joshua follows this with a little explanation. He says, you see, the Lord your God is a jealous God. When he says that, he's speaking about God's 100% obligation places on these people. Kind of like the past few weeks, we've, we've looked at passages from Matthew's Gospel in which Jesus has been teaching about what God expects. And one week we talked about that greatest commandment. And the Pharisees asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? He said, it is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, with everything you have. No, there's no way you can really do that, is there? You're going to fall down sometime. You're going to fall short of that. The passage today, the parable of the five foolish and five wise bridesmaids, the lesson, always be awake, always be alert to what God wants you to do, to what's expected of you. It's a wonderful reminder, but no one can really live up to it all the time. And so Joshua says, because God is so demanding of you, demands your whole life, your all, you won't be able to do it. The word jealous in our translations is not a popular word for us. We often think of that as a quality that is not one we should embrace. So some biblical scholars have pointed out that the word might better be translated zealous or passionate. God is passionate for you, Joshua says to the people, and in turn, God expects you to be passionate for him. Joshua didn't say they would never be able to obey God and serve him, but they simply had their limits as mortals. You know, I remember in high school, I had a coach who, uh, he was a great guy, but he would walk around while we we're doing some drill or while we we're training in the off season or something. And you know, you're sweating and you're working as hard as you can. And, and he'd be counting out the repetitions you're doing. And he would you know, rub his hands together with his little dip of snuff in his cheek. And he'd say, you can always do one more. And you know, Coach Taylor, if you're somehow picking this up on YouTube, you know, I, I've always wanted to say this to you. I love you, but you're wrong. You can't just do one more because eventually one more makes you keel over. I mean, we have our limits, don't we, um, as to how much we can give. 
Nevertheless, the point is that trying, devoting ourselves to serving God is important. I mean, I know we often don't talk this way, and trying is not a theological category. We say often, you know, we're saved by grace, through faith, not by works. All that is true, and we certainly believe it. But we shouldn't discount this idea that we can try really hard to serve the Lord. It makes a difference. And Joshua seems to be calling the people of Israel as they've entered the land God has given them to devote themselves to him and to give themselves fully, as fully as they can, in this relationship with God. It does make a difference how much effort we put toward it. There's that wonderful movie from 20 years ago or so, Murphy's Romance, and you remember it. It's a story about a woman named Emma, played by Sally Field. She has taken her young son and left her deadbeat husband named Bobby Joe, and they have moved to a little town in Arizona where they're starting over. She meets this man, Murphy, who's a pillar of the town in the community, falls in love with him. Eventually, they get married. But in the middle of the story, the husband, Bobby Joe, shows back up, and he wants to get back together with Emma. And she's tempted by this. And then, after a day or so of contemplating it, she comes home and finds a young woman there in her living room holding two babies, twin boys. Uh, they're Bobby Joe's children. And she takes him out on the front porch and sits down with him and just sort of reams him out. She said, you know, you're just good for nothing. He says to her, uh, well, Emma, I ain't perfect. And her response to him is, Bobby Joe, you've never even been close. <laughs> Joshua, at least part of what he's saying to us is, you know, be as close as you can, it seems. The, how do we do this? The two commands, put away foreign gods, serve the Lord, are actually related to each other very, very closely. For when Joshua gives the command to put away the foreign gods, he uses language that calls up this story of the patriarch Jacob. Jacob, when he left his uh, father-in-law's house, they possessed there the family gods, things that every family, it seemed, kept around, these good luck charms, <laughs> things people worshipped and bowed down to, hoping they would bring them good fortune. But Jacob decided, no, these are not our gods. We worship the one true God, and so they created a little ceremony. They went out and dug a hole under a tree and buried the gods and put them away in a way that was very tangible. They created a kind of, of ceremony for it. And this is the kind of thing that maybe helps us as well, because in putting away those foreign gods, it was one step toward serving the Lord. I know a woman who gives testimony to working diligently to try to be the person, grow into the person she knows God wants her to be. And she says, you know, what helps me sometimes is that I write down little things that I should do and not do on post-it notes. And I put them on the mirror or on the dresser. And they're there always to call this to mind to me, to look for the good in other people. Take a larger view. When you're about to judge someone, put yourself in that person's shoes. Open your heart to the needs of others. Be patient. And on and on, all as a way of reminding her that these things that you put away move you closer to serving the Lord. All these help express our commitment to God. They help us meet God's passion for us with our passion for God. 
So when Joshua says you can't serve the Lord, we might say, well, of course, we know. Uh, as Paul said, we've all fallen short of the glory of God, and we do so every day. But Joshua kind of gives a hint here that God already knows that, and that this God who is passionate for us, who invites us to be passionate for him, part of his commitment to us is that he's already forgiven us for our shortcomings. After all, the little rehearsal of salvation that Joshua gives doesn't say that God called Abraham and the ancestors to be faithful and then acted on their behalf. It said that God acted on their behalf and then called them to be faithful. We know that's true of who God is because we've seen it in Jesus Christ, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, as Paul says. In Christ, we see God's love taking form. We see this passion that God has for us, this zeal God has for us, playing out in Jesus' sacrifice for our sakes. So Joshua, at the end of this ceremony, as I was saying to the children, sets up a stone that's there as a reminder of the promises they've made, of the expectations God has for them, and in a way, it speaks to them. Call them back to that relationship to God over and over again. Sometimes things like that are helpful for us. But we have maybe the greatest reminder here, the table that Christ has set before us. It helps us, if we are tempted to forget it, who God is, how much God loves us, and out of God's love for us, he then calls us serve him. So as we gather around the table, will you let this be the reminder to you of the passion, the zeal God has for you. And in responding in love and thanksgiving, work and do your best to serve the Lord. Amen. Would you join me as we say, in response to God's word, what we believe, saying together the Apostles' Creed. Would you stand if you are able? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, on the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We give thanks for the gifts of God's people, for the service of God. Let us now give thanks. to us, especially for your sacrifice that we know in Jesus Christ our Lord. We ask that you would give us the strength to respond to you in thanksgiving, that our lives might be devoted to you, that you might use us in your service. We ask that you take the gifts that we offer and multiply them, that they might be part of the sending of your word out into the world. In the name of, the, of Christ we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The 
table set before us anticipates that great banquet when Jesus ushers in the kingdom of God, a banquet in which we sit down at table with and fellowship with him. The promise of scripture is that people will come from north and south, east and west, to sit at table in this banquet that God has prepared for us. Let us lift up our hearts and let us give thanks. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. O God, it is truly good for us to give you thanks and praise. For we remember how you created the world and declared it good. So we know the life that you give us is part of your purpose. And yet we also know that even though it is good and what you've given us is good, we have corrupted by our rebellion, by our turning away from you. Part of your goodness we see in the fact that you have not rejected us, but continually, patiently welcome us back into fellowship with you. And so we see in your forbearance, your holiness, and your goodness. And so we declare in praise with myriads of angels and saints through the ages, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. O oh God, we do know that your holiness takes the form of mercy. That in the ages of your people, you saw their rebellion and called them back to you by sending messengers, priests and prophets and wise men men and women who taught your word, who showed your people your way. Even so, however, they turned away from you, even as we do. And so in the fullness of time, you sent Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught the way of truth, who was rejected by the people, who was crucified and died, but whom you rose from the dead. And so, we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. In Jesus Christ, O oh Lord, we have come to know who you are, that you have come to redeem the world, that the world, even though it rejects you, you love. And so you've also come to be with us, to complete the work you began in creation, and we also are assured that you are for us. And so we dare approach you with petitions of our hearts, asking that you be with those who are sick and those who are struggling, asking that you would make the world what, it, what you intended it to be, that you would fill it with your righteousness and justice. And so we list today the names of those who are on our hearts, we ask that you would be with Debbie Hixenbaugh. We pray for Owen Hixenbaugh as he recovers from surgery. We pray for Arlene Magnotti. We ask that you would be with Ray Racunas as he prepares for surgery. We ask that you would gather your spirit around Kathy Jones Wasaki and Nancy Ann Gashel. That you would be with Tim Stewart, Jack Rahaley, and Doug Coomer, all going through cancer treatment. We ask that you would be with Betty McAdoo and aid her in healing. We pray for all those who have served our country, who've given themselves to it, that we might enjoy freedom. We pray your blessing upon them this week as we recognize them. We pray for our nation, that you would heal our divisions, that you would show us our shortcomings and lead us together to find the way to you. We pray all these things knowing that there are other needs that we have that we have not and maybe cannot mention. And so we, list, we name them for you now in silence, knowing that you hear our prayers and know them before we offer them. We 
pray, O God, as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Scripture tells us that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he was at a meal with his disciples, and after the meal was over, he took bread, and broke it, and blessed it, and gave it to them, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. In the same way, he took a cup, and after he had blessed it, he gave it to them, and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for the remission of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so he gives us the bread and the cup, the gifts of God for the people of God, the meal he set before us to remind us of his great love for us. Would you come and partake of the meal together now?
us pray. Oh God, you have fed us with your very self. You have given us your grace, poured it out to us, knowing that we are frail children of dust, and you remember that we are dust, and so you come to us and offer us your salvation despite all the ways we failed you and one another. We ask that you would go send us forth from this place in the light of your grace, with your countenance shining upon us, remembering that you go with us, receiving us as your children, and sending us forth in the world to give testimony not of our own goodness, but of your goodness and of your mercy. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. to love and serve the Lord, remembering that the power you have to serve him comes from the remembrance that he has already served you first through Jesus Christ our Lord. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with you this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>